got stuck. Okay, it's going. It's live. It's All right. <laughs> Hello, friends. Welcome to Watch What Happens Live at Turi. Um, I'm just trying to live out my Andy Cohen Real Housewives fantasy. So we've decided to call the show Watch What Happens Live at Turing. I hope you don't copyright that, Andy. Uh, so we're doing Watch What Happens Live with the real instructors of Turing. Uh, we did it. We've got Robbie over here. Hi. You want to introduce yourself? Um, and Brittany. So we'll have Robbie go first and just like tell us um, who you are, where you're like from, and like what you do here at Turing. Cool. So I'm Robbie. I uh, was a student in the 1603 cohort, and then. After I graduated, I joined as an instructor on the front end team. Cool. I'm Brittany. I just moved to Denver from Boston. I was previously in engineering positions, and now I'm an instructor on the front end program and also the technical lead. So yeah, Brittany, we uh, we courted um, from afar, whereas <laughs> Robbie was one of our students here at Turing, so a little bit different paths on how to get here but um, they're both still here, so we might be doing something right here. But um, Brittany, tell us a little bit more about like before Turing, what you were doing at, and how you got here. Sure, so before Turing, I was working at the New York Times and also at Mozilla doing engineering work. Um, I previously worked in media really frequently. I was a journalism major, so I really liked working in industries that were a little like bit outside news, of tech. Like fake news, though? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Only the fake stuff, <laughs> nothing <clear>. real. Okay. <laughs> nothing real. So I always enjoyed working in industries that were a little bit outside of tech. Um, one thing that's great about being an engineer is that every industry needs them. So uh, my most recent position at Mozilla was a little bit too meta being at a, a tech company working in tech and I really found the education aspect of Turing really appealing. Yeah, and Jeff, of course. We all find Jeff to so appealing as, <laughs> as our boss. So. Um, Robbie, tell us a little bit about your journey because uh, you came from Chicago and yeah, so I, I came from Chicago and then moved to Boston, uh, where I was working for a software company doing technical writing there. And uh, I had previously studied engineering before that and worked uh, doing a lot of like data processing. And so I wanted to get back into that coding, uh, like tooling, because I loved like taking data, like taking a bunch of data, transforming it into something so moved to Denver uh, and then found out about Turing through some friends and like loved the idea of it, loved being able to like change your career in seven months into like a totally new industry. Yeah. So I took it on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, remind me, what were you guys called at your last job? Mathletes? <laughs> no. <laughs> I worked for MathWorks. MathWorks. We were called Math, math Workers. workers. Yeah. Yes. Um, so coming to Turing, you don't have like a really cool term to describe you. That's no. unfortunate. Um, but there are some perks of, of being um, an instructor here. But uh, Brittany, what do you like about like teaching? What's what um, you, you said like teaching really appeals to you, but what about that really appeals to you? Yeah, there's a couple things. So I've been teaching for just a couple months now, but um, a couple things that stand out to me the most are just how um, contagious the students' excitement is. So they're always really excited about even the simplest things that I might normally find. Like, I've done this a thousand times, I'm like, this isn't that cool, but once a student is like, that's really cool, I'm like, oh yeah, you're right, it is. Like, that is cool. So I love the, just like the atmosphere and how, how the students can kind of rub off on you that way. Um, and I've also learned a lot since I've been here. I think one of the things you miss out on when you're in strictly engineering roles is that foundational knowledge, especially when you're self-taught. Um, you don't necessarily know how to articulate what it is that you're doing or explain the, the nitty gritty details of what you're building. Uh, but then once you're up in front of a classroom and you have to explain it and you have students asking you the weirdest questions like, you better know what you're doing and you better know how to say it. So I've learned a lot from all of the weird questions that our students ask. Yeah, I, I totally think that's true. I think like we learn so much by teaching um, and that's probably true for like all of our students here. But um, Robbie, what like keeps you at Turing? What, what makes you um, excited to be here? So I went through the back end program um, and then joined the front end team because I liked uh, in, in the last module even on the back end side, you learn more front end technologies and really got into that. Um, and so when I joined the front end team, I still had like a lot to learn on the front end side. 
So still learning by teaching, of course. Um, like every module, learning, learning more material uh, for front end. And then another aspect of teaching is like the mentorship part. So your class is usually like 20 to 30 people and you're basically like in charge of mentoring them, keeping, make, like making sure that everyone is on the same page uh, and giving uh, like attention to any struggling students. So, so being able to like mentor and hopefully use that in my next job, wherever that is, um, to be able to, to use that. Sometimes I think it's scary that we've been given all this power, but it feels pretty good. <laughs> um, but uh, cool. So, um, Brittany, before you were here, you probably worked on some pretty cool projects. You told me about one cool one. I can't tell you okay. about that one. Uh, can you tell us about a project that you ha can tell us about <laughs> that you're excited um, that you really liked working on? Uh, so the most recent project I had worked on at my last position um, at Mozilla was really exciting. Um, we were starting to build some applications and some internal tooling for doing A-B testing in Firefox, the browser. So we would have developers that were using Firefox regularly and... I'm not would, sure who does that anymore, by the way, but... <laughs> ...would <laughs> sign up for... Um, you know, the experimental features. It's similar to people that are using Chrome. They might use Canary to get those most, sure. the latest, most experimental features. Um, and when we had people sign up for these, we wanted to A-B test like new features and new experiments for them. So we had to set up a lot of internal tooling that would actually push these experiments to particular users. So getting that little sample set of cool. users that we wanted to push these experiments to and making sure we blocked off the other ones was pretty challenging. We definitely sent out a bunch of experiments that maybe we shouldn't have sure. to <laughs> different people, but it was not without problems, but it was really interesting um, problems that we were trying to solve with that project. Cool. I thought that was really cool. The other thing that we were going to talk about like, is definitely not something that is illegal. So, Robbie, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what about a project you built? Um, I think the project I had the most fun with was um, when I was a student working on a database for honeybee hive health. It was called Hive Health. Um, so basically, we get creative as students. Yeah, yeah totally. Super yeah, we're so good at naming things. Yep. Um, so basically, a user would go on and uh, they would have they would be like a beekeeper, even like an amateur beekeeper, and then log the the health of their bee colony. And so you could generate a map and see uh, the general health of bee colonies across the nation, uh, and then use hopefully be able to like use an open API to gather data about like health across uh, the nation. Maybe if you're studying like colony collapse disorder, it might be useful. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I think it's cool to like incorporate what you're interested in into your projects. Like I made a project about games, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, what about that other website you wanted to build? <laughs> yeah, that's a, for another episode of what happens live at Turing. Um, In-depth conversation. Um, what, like, Ravi, what one piece of advice might you give a student who wants to come to Turing, um, who's interested in the program, potentially? Um, I think I would first, um, like, if you're interested in Turing, make sure that you're interested in, um, programming itself and not just the lifestyle of a programmer. So go check out like Coursera or um, what is it, Precode Academy. Um, check out those classes, get your hands dirty in like HTML, JavaScript, Ruby, uh, whatever you're interested in. And then um, I would say like explore your passions and see how the web could affect those. And then you'll have some ideas of how you want to apply things and like keep excited about developing for those applications. Yeah. Brittany, what about you? Yeah, I think similar to what Robbie said, I think the most exciting applications always come from things that you want to build. And we see a lot of people that have these great ideas, but they don't know how to actually execute them because they don't have the technical skills yet. So that's kind of where we can come in and help them out with the things that they want to put to use. Like Robbie said, you wanted to be able to put data to use and actually build things with that. Um, 
there are so many great ideas out there, and if we can just level up people with their technical skills and get those apps out there, I think the world will be a much better place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or worse. Especially the, the apps I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, great. Well, uh, we've got a Twitter question. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> we don't. But we're going to watch what happens live. Uh, but, so our Twitter question is a fun one, and we're going to wrap this up, but I'm going to ask you guys, what is your least favorite animal? Um, I know that's a weird question, because, like, who talks about hating animals? But me personally, like, I'm actually really not a fan of pigeons. Um, I think they're gross. I don't think anyone likes them. Yeah, so, yeah, I would I would go without pigeons. So what about you, Brittany? Yeah, I think I could live without sloths. Uh, oh, okay. I used to really like them, but now everybody is obsessed with them. Sure. And I see them all over the internet, and now I just think they're overrated. So right. now I'm like, they're not that cool, everybody. Yeah, no, it's like that opposite effect of like when something's trendy, you don't want to like it. Yeah, yeah. like the 80s. Yeah, like, ew. <laughs> Madonna. Madonna. Uh, least favorite animal. I guess, would you consider a mosquito an animal? No. Why not? It's a bug. It's a, it's a bug. Insect. Nobody likes insects. Who likes any Yeah, insects? like, who likes mosquitoes? I don't know. He hates puppies. Snakes. <laughs> Snakes. <laughs> Snakes. Snakes. I once uh, was camping, and we were looking at the stars at night, and then five minutes later, a rattlesnake started to rattle. Oh, we okay. had to go to the tent and hide. I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, wraps up. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk more about snakes and <laughs> pigeons and uh, sloths. Um, and I think that we just maybe lost a fan in Kristen Bell, though, because she loves sloths. And Sorry, Kristen. I know you're watching. Um, anyway, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week with the Real House Instructors. <laughs>